Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of June 25th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about the three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we begin looking into the issues that we think will be important in the upcoming election cycle. The three we cover this week are these. First, why we think the PFD will be an important issue in individual Alaska legislative races. Second, why we think the federal budget is a real issue in Don Young's race. And third, the reason we think oil credits will continue to be an issue in this year's state races. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Guess I had to flick that switch, didn't I? Brad Keithley is a former oil and gas consultant, uh, attorney. He's uh, also the founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He joins us right now to talk about issues inside the state with the uh, legislature, with the elections, the governor, the whole thing. Brad Keithley joins us this morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great. How are you this morning? You know what? It's uh, there's just there's no it's this there's, there's just no downside, I guess, uh, to today. It's a beautiful day out, looking like we're ready to uh, get ready for another one. So I'm I'm happy to any day above ground, as my grandfather used to say, is a good day. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, this is certainly one of those. It's be- it's beautiful. I'm up in. Denali this week, and it's beautiful up here as well. Yeah, no, absolutely, uh, absolutely. It looks like I, I follow some of the things you post on on uh, Facebook or Instagram, and I'm just like, wow, I, I'm in the wrong business. I should have become an oil and gas consultant because that's a that's a, in retirement. It's nice to hang out there by the lake and the thing and the mountains and everything. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, some of your top three to, uh, this week. You've got some good stuff coming in uh, to discuss. Number first and foremost, I think uh, we could talk a little bit about why this is a big year for a governor's race, but the legislature also matters in those uh, in those circumstances. Yeah, the um, I've I've been recently delving into so, some people have focused their in almost their entire attention on the governor's race uh, with respect to the PFD issue. They have, they have argued that, you know, electing Dunleavy, uh, if you're on the Republican side, or Begich if you're on another side, uh, both of whom uh, have said that they support protection of the PFD, the PFD as is, um, that that's where the focus ought to be. And as I've been thinking through that issue, I've, I've come to realize that, that that's not correct. Um, And it goes back to the Supreme Court decision last year that dealt with the PFD that essentially found that regardless of what the PFD statute says, which which is it it still reads this way, that the permanent fund corporation shall distribute 50 percent of the earnings to the to the permanent fund uh, division, permanent fund dividend division of Department of Revenue, who shall then distribute it, that notwithstanding the fact the word says shall in the statute that, according to the Supreme Court, the legislature can uh, appropriate whatever it wants to, uh, to the permanent fund dividend. That the legislature, unlike everybody else in the state of Alaska, the legislature doesn't have to follow the statutes uh, and can and can make it up as they go along. That decision really changes the dynamics of how the PFD plays uh, on out. Not only is it subject to 
uh, a veto. That's what the litigation was about, that the governor can veto uh, a portion of the PFD, use his line item power to veto a portion of the PFD, but also that the legislature uh, can change the PFD uh, by appropriation. That means that even if Mike Dunleavy or Mark Begich are elected governor and fully support the PFD, that the legislature has the ultimate control because they can appropriate less than than the full amount. Right. And of all the power of all the powers the Alaska governor has, which are which are many, very strong governor in this state, not one of those is the ability to add money back to legislative appropriations. So if the legislature would appropriate less than a full PFD, notwithstanding whoever the governor is, uh, that governor is, is his hands are going to be tied. He's not going to be able to uh, uh, add any additional uh, money back to the PFD, and, and that's what the PFD will be. So that has it, it's dawned on me as I've thought through that process that not only is the governor's race important from the standpoint of the PFD, but each individual legislative race is is also critically important because we're going to have to have, to restore the PFD, we're going to have to have not only a governor who will sign the bill when the full PFD comes through, but we're going to have to have legislators who will pass a full PFD uh, before it gets to the governor. Right. And this could lead to some real horse trading in the long run. I mean, you know, some hostage taking, as it were. Uh, Governor will go ahead and give you a full PFD, but if and only if you promise not to veto our... Uh, you know, our pet project in, in wherever it is, our AstroTurf fields up in some village somewhere that, you know, cost millions of dollars that, you know, will be used for 16 days out of the year. We promise that, uh, you know, if you promise not to veto then, then we'll give it to you. Otherwise, we ain't giving you the full dividend. I mean, it really is going to be a game of chicken, I think, in a lot of ways. It is, and and that's a sad thing. I mean, statutes... Statutes ought to mean what statutes say, right? The legislature should have to abide by uh, statutes uh, in the same way that every other Alaskan has to has to abide by it. But the Supreme Court said no, uh, and we sort of have to live with that. And it really does change the the dynamic. I mean, you you can the last legislature we saw that that a large number of legislators, a significant number of legislators, put more emphasis on spending. Uh, in certain categories than they did on the PFD. They passed a bill, they passed the operating budget that had funding for a number of things, increases for a number of things, an increase for the university uh, after, after you know, starting to get the university under control. They sort of, they sort of let off the, the relief valve and the university got increased funding, an increased drop for K-12 through spending uh, at the end of the session. Um, and, and a vari- wide variety of other things, they put more priority on that than they did on the PFD because they cut the PFD uh, in the end. So you have a governor that comes in, a governor that says, I want a full PFD, and then you're going to have legislators who are going to say, some legislators who are going to say, well, yeah, you want a full PFD. Well, that's interesting. I want you know, an additional $100 million for the university, or I want right. an additional, you know, uh, an additional uh, change to the uh, to the base student uh, allowance in the uh, in K through 12 funding, or I want an right. addition here, or I want a new building there, and it's and and it, you can easily see how that spirals out of control if you don't have a legislature that's committed first and foremost to living up to the statutes. You can easily see how that spirals out of control because Governor Dunleavy goes, well, look, you know, I'm not going to give you uh, uh, additional funding for the university. And and the legislate and, and legislators, if there's enough of them, if there's a majority, and, and this is regardless of either body. I mean, we've seen that one body can hold up the other body. So if 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 a majority in one body says, well, that's interesting, but we want a hundred million more for the university, and and after the standoff, I mean, the governor has to decide: do you want the full PFD, or are you willing to give some on the uh, on the funding for for what the legislature is. You know, what legislators are pushing for, and you can see how that just spirals back out of control. Sp- spending spirals back out of control again. So, it is it is the, the the PFD issue. Given the Supreme Court's decision, the PFD issue is is critical not only in the governor's race, but it's critical also 
in uh, in legislative races. And frankly, Michael, I think it, that bleeds over to the lieutenant governor's race as well. Now, certainly you want a lieutenant governor, if, if God forbid something would happen to the governor, certainly you want a lieutenant governor who would step up and be supportive uh, of the PFD. But But as we go through this legislative process, I think it's important also to have somebody in the lieutenant governor's office because you know legislators will 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 play everybody once you get going in Juneau they'll play everybody i think it's important to have a lieutenant governor who is savvy enough on the legislative process and on the financial process and the budgeting process to be able to pl- be a positive force a helpful force uh in dealing with the legislature uh on this issue so the the, the issue is to me now permeates not only the governor's race, but it permeates all of the other statewide state races as well. Well, and again, especially with a legislature that has, as you mentioned earlier, and we've talked about in the past, proven itself to be more interested in protecting the public sector economy over the private economy. That that is apparently the priority of the majority of legislatures in both chambers of the legislature. Yeah, it's I mean, the the Senate Republicans started this right even before Governor Walker vetoed um, uh, the PFD uh, three years ago now uh, or three uh, fiscal years ago. Now, uh, the Senate had passed a bill uh, that that restructured the permanent fund um, and the payments from the permanent fund and cut the PFD from 50 percent of flows out of the permanent fund uh, into the earnings uh, down to 25 percent. Uh, they also did POMV, so it wasn't 25% of earnings, but it was close. Um, and so you, you, I'm, you, you've seen this in the in the Senate. You saw that. You've seen it now in the House with the passage of the operating budget. Um, there's just, I mean, you, there's a lot of dynamics that go on in the legislature, and and it's if for people who are concerned about what's going on in the state, concerned about the overall state economy, uh, concerned about the impact. Uh, on uh, on families, uh, uh, cutting the PFD is the worst thing you can do for both of those. Uh, ICER analyses have told us that since 2016. For people who are concerned about the overall economy, concerned about Alaska families, they need to be concerned about the PFD, and they need to be concerned about the PFD, need, need to be focused on candidates' position, not only in the governor's race, but also uh, in the legislative races. What uh, you've just mentioned, how important do you think the lieutenant governor's race is here as well? Game out for me, you know, I mean, how you see the scenario, you know, they're, they're obviously going to get worked on both sides. How does the um, um, how, how does that play out? I mean, give me a scenario where I mean, sure. how does that how does that work with the lieutenant governor being part of this whole discussion? Sure. Sure, it's gonna it's gonna be an all hands on deck. I mean, preserving the PFD is gonna be an all hands on deck deal. Uh, it's gonna be the governor uh, certainly working the legislature, uh, but you know, in all honesty, uh, uh, Mark Begich uh, uh, never never served in the, has never served in the legislature. He's been a lot of other things, right. but he's never served in the state legislature. Uh, and Mike Dunleavy did serve in the legislature, but he stepped out of the caucus. Um, uh, for, for good reasons, but stepped out of the caucus and really um, uh, tried to run a couple of bills in the legislature while he was there. Uh, wasn't quite successful. One of the reasons he stepped out of the caucus. Um, so you've got you've got two candidates, both of whom support the PFD, but have have don't have you know nitty gritty hands on experience in how these things can work uh, through the legislature. Uh, you'll have a chief of staff. You'll have in the governor's office. You'll have a chief of staff. You'll have uh, uh, a, a legislative uh, liaison, uh, sort of the chief lobbyist inside the administration. But a lieutenant governor can be helpful, very helpful as well uh, in in working the process. If you have a lieutenant governor who understands the system, um, there are really two candidates for lieutenant governor on the Republican side uh, that have well three, if you count Gary Stevens, but. Two, two primary candidates on the lieutenant governor side who have experience in this area in the legislature. One's uh, Senator Kevin Meyer, and the other is Representative Lynn Gaddis, both of whom served on the finance committees while they were in the legislature, uh, both of whom uh, worked these issues. Kevin uh, uh, has, has been one of the consistent voices for cutting the PFD. He was one of the sponsors, co-sponsors of the Senate bill early on to restructure the uh, the uh, the flows from the PFD 
uh, to turn it into a POMV and to cut the PFD take from 50% down to 25%. He voted for, uh, continued to vote for those cuts uh, this past year, not, never been uh, a PFD uh, supporter since this controversy started. Lynn, on the other hand, uh, not only has that experience, but uh, has her hands dirty uh, down the ditches uh, defending the PFD. Uh, when the Senate passed the bill uh, in the last legislature uh, in 2016, early in 2016, that's when GCI made the Alaska First lobbying effort to go out and, uh, and pass a, G, uh, a, permanent fund, a permanent fund restructuring act, and the Senate went along with that. That Senate bill came over to the House, um, and it ultimately died in House finance due to the work, frankly, of Lynn Gaddis and Tammy Wilson. Uh, both of whom are sitting on Senate finance. They know the issues. They know the they know the battles. They know where uh, the, uh, the 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 hot points are as it works through the legislature. And I think that uh, that a lieutenant governor working closely with the governor uh, on the issue could be very additive to the process. Somebody who has experience uh, in dealing with these issues as they come through the legislature. I mean, there are other ca- lieutenant governor candidates who have a lot of enthusiasm and have a lot of uh, and have very strong feelings about the PFD, and I applaud that, and I applaud the enthusiasm, but they don't have the experience in working with the legislature, knowing where the bodies are buried, knowing where the push points are, knowing how to how to block things. They don't have that experience in working with the legislature that I think is going to be critical uh, in dealing with this issue as uh, as it comes through the legislature. So I'm not, this is not this is not saying anything bad about other candidates other than Kevin who opposes the PFD, right. but it is saying, it is saying good things about, about somebody, Lynn, who has experience in dealing with this issue um, and, uh, and successfully dealt with this issue while I was in the legislature. And as I said, this is going to be an issue where we need all hands on deck. So I, just, um, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's just a plus. I have to laugh because as you've been describing this whole scenario, all I can think of is the lieutenant governor is the consigliere of, uh, of, of, of the governor. He's the leg breaker out there, you know, holding people in back rooms and saying, you're going to do a, you're going to, going to do what's good for you or else. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree that that would definitely probably be a very strong point. Um, I'm not, no, I don't know if the people, uh, are going to be agreeing with us on that. Again, there's, there's that strong sentiment of, uh, you know, change that I think we've seen at the national level that's floating its way down, uh, on this. So I'm not a hundred percent sure that the people are going to agree with you on that, but it will definitely be interesting. And I would agree it would make the process a lot easier if you had somebody that understood it. Um, uh, this goes back to the fact that, uh, I question whether or not we really need some term limits in the legislature simply because we get too many people that are so baked in there. Only insiders understand how it work, uh, how it works. And so that makes it very difficult for anything to happen if anybody new shows up. And I, and I think that's a real shame, quite honestly. Yeah, it's um, uh, there's a lot of conflicting uh, our arguments in favor of or, or against uh, uh, term limits. I don't really want to throw it into in, into this issue. I, I, what, what's really important here is that is that as we evaluate candidates, I mean, there 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 are the, the Peter Macheki race down in the valley. Let's let's let, down in, or down in the Kenai. I'm sorry, sure. down in the Kenai. Let's pick on let's pick on that for a moment. Macheki is somebody who supported cutting the PFD, somebody who supported increasing spending for the university, somebody who, who supported increased spending for uh, 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 that, that $30 million they added in at the end for, uh, for K through 12. No doubt, you know, no doubt, uh, well, uh, well, maybe well spent by, by K through 12, but it's adding money in a, in, a, in a cycle, in a fiscal cycle where we don't have it to add. We're taking it additional money out of savings or borrowing additional money from the the constitutional budget reserve um and it's and it's money we don't have but he supported that uh supported those two things increased spending in those areas at the same time as he favored cutting the pfd well you reelect elect and and put him back into the senate uh and that's a vote uh that's gonna you know that's gonna be looking to play games with with whatever new governor is there uh, maybe supporting the PFD, but conditioning it on, uh, conditioning it on other things, or maybe in the end not supporting the PFD, uh, a full PFD at all. So, 
Right. If you can't get this bill out of the legislature, if you can't get the PFD appropriation out of the legislature, no matter who the governor is, uh, we're not going to get the PFD restored. machecki has got an opponent, Ron Gillum. Um, and so I, what, I'm, what I'm urging is that voters in these districts uh, where you have a choice between somebody who's uh, supported cutting the PFD in the past and somebody who supports a full PFD, that that's a very important consideration, not be, not only because it tells you something about your legislator, but it also tells you, uh, but it also is is important to uh, restoring the PFD going forward. So that's that's the issue that I think uh, uh, people need to focus on. People who you know place a priority on the overall Alaska economy, place a priority on Alaska families. That's the issue that I think people need to focus on uh, in this coming election cycle. Right. And speaking of election cycle, I mean, this is all of the state races, uh, which are obviously very important to those of us here in the state, but there are still big issues that face us uh, at the national level. Uh, and especially, specifically in Don Young's race, there are some big issues in the federal budget that are actually, whether he likes it or not, going to become a key component in his race for re-election in Congress, Mike, Michael, I think so. I, Don is the only statewide federal person on the ballot uh, uh, this cycle. Uh, neither Dan Sullivan nor Lisa Murkowski are on the ballot, or else they'd be facing this issue as well. Don sort of gets it because he's the he's he's the one uh, on the ballot. I saw an ad for him. The other, what triggered this this in my mind? I saw an ad for him the other day, touting the tax cuts, uh, and and talking about you know how important the tax cuts were and and why you know we need to return Don Young to Congress essentially because he's the one that delivers on the tax cuts. Well, y- yeah, but the tax cuts resulted in an increase in the deficit. You can't just look at the tax cuts in isolation, or you can't just look at 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 that issue, the the, the revenue side issue, uh, in isolation, you have to look at the spending side. Don Young also voted for uh, adding an additional trillion dollars uh, to spending and an additional over ten years and an additional trillion dollars uh, to the national debt as a result of that. We've got a national debt that uh, that is now projected to exceed a trillion. It, it started at the beginning of the Trump administration. Started at about six hundred. Fifty billion dollars is now projected to exceed a trillion dollars annually uh, within the next two years. The debt, total national debt, is projected to go from twenty trillion dollars uh, uh, currently to over thirty trillion dollars uh, in the next ten years. Congress uh, uh, just uh, uh, failed to enact. Uh, the House did, but but the Senate failed to enact. Um, a proposed rescissions bill from the Trump administration that would have cut a grand total, once you netted out all of the things that really didn't matter, a grand total of $1 billion from from spending over the next 10 years. Congress voted, uh, the Senate voted against even that. Uh, we, we've got a $20 trillion uh, uh, national deficit. So we, we've got real problems. The CBO, Congressional Budget, Budget Office, just came out this morning with their new long-term projections uh, of, uh, of the deficit they're projecting uh, that we exceed uh, 100 uh, or 100 percent of gross domestic products or the, the, the rule of thumb that you use in these things, the relationship of national debt to gross domestic product. We exceed 100 percent of gross domestic product uh, inside uh, 10 years. We, we go 150 percent above a gross domestic product uh, in the in the 2040s uh, based on the current track uh, that we're on. So you can't just say, oh, good on you, Don, uh, you voted for tax cuts. You have to you have to look at the total fisc- fiscal picture and what's going on from the total fiscal perspective. Social Security, uh, we've now started to go into the corpus, the principal of the of the Social Security Trust Fund. That's sort of like spending from the Excuse me. It's sort of like spending from the permanent fund principle um, uh, when it comes to Social Security. That's scheduled. That we're scheduled now on track to run through all of the trust fund by 2034. We're we're scheduled to run through the trust fund, the Medicare trust fund, by 2026. 
uh, we've got we've got a huge amount <laughs> of fiscal issues that are piling up uh, on 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 the nation and uh, from our national fiscal perspective. And and Don Young is voted for a lot of them. Right. So, yes, there's the tax cut. You can you can sort of look at the tax cut in isolation and say, yep, voted for that. But at the same time, he's voting for things uh, that add t- tremendously to the national debt uh, and add tremendously to the fiscal uh, uh, situation that we're getting ourselves have gotten ourselves into and continue to get ourselves into in in the coming in the coming years. So you've got to look at is Don Young the right guy going forward, uh, not only from tax cuts, good for you, Don, but from the total fiscal picture. And and his track record is not a solid one on it. So that's an issue that we need to be talking about. Well, uh, as the as the federal as the federal race starts. Well, and I think, but then again, this leads me back to your previous commentary on the lieutenant governor. I mean, we had to know people, you know, somebody who knew where the pressure points were, who where the bodies were buried. This is the same argument that I've heard in discussing whether or not Don Young should be naming his successor. Would that be the smarter thing to do? Because he is the old man of the of the of the house. He knows where everything is. He's got the favors. He's got the longevity. He's got the seniority. And so, isn't it the same argument when it's down to that? I mean, uh, if it's the same, if we're asking the same kind of questions? Well, yeah, but he's got to use it as a force for good, right? I, mean, I, I agree. To, I we, mean, I, we, yeah. We, 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 we've got to, I mean, we, we, yes, he does have that longevity. Yes, he does have those contacts. Yes, he does has that, does have that ability. But is he using it as a force for good when it comes, when it comes to national fiscal issues? And, and the answer is, it's not it he's voting for things that add to the national deficit he's voting for things that that increase uh, the annual deficit above a trillion dollars he's voting for uh, additional spending he's voting for policies that are draining the social security account and draining the medicare trust fund so yes he's got he's got a lot of contacts he's got a lot of a lot of uh, a, a lot of experience but it has to be used for good. I mean, it's it's sort of the equivalent. If we go back to the lieutenant governor's race, it'd sort of be the equivalent of the Kevin Meyer argument, right? Kevin says, "I've got a lot of experience. I've been chair of finance. I was House finance. I've been co-chair of Senate finance. I've been, you know, president of the Senate. I've, I'm now chairman of the Rules Committee. I've got a lot of experience." But yes, Kevin, but you've used it. You've used it to cut the PFD. I mean, you've used it for the you've used all that experience for the wrong thing. You come back over to Don Young. Yes, Don, you've got all that experience, but what are you using it for? You're using it for to to vote on things and to push things along that increase the national debt and and increase the annual deficit. So it's got to be the experience has got to has got to be a force for good. It can't be a can't be a force for bad. <laughs> I was waiting for the Meyer Young comparison. That's really what I was waiting for. So I mean, that was because I mean, I I've been in agreement with this. I mean, and I think that you could look at the track record, and if we use that metric for every legislator up there right now, we could get the the electorate to really clean house and maybe make a difference and change what I said earlier, which of course is you know we need to quit the business as usual, and if we could get some fresh blood in there maybe we wouldn't have to deal with that it would be it would be its own self-limiting term limit thing because people would just say no more with you you're 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 not using your powers for good with great power comes great responsibility you're out we're putting somebody else in so uh i I mean i have to i have to agree with that and you look at the spending at the national level and i think sometimes people have a hard time wrapping their brains around you know numbers when it comes to trillions but again to me the 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 canary in the coal mine is the fact that i mean we had Rand paul put in a bill that would have cut you know uh, i i think it was two pennies out of every dollar spent would have been the overall you know future dollars not even current dollars but i think it was future dollars two pennies out of every future dollar spent couldn't get any traction with it. This one where they couldn't cut a simple affected $1 billion out of a multi-trillion dollar potential uh, deficit in the future. That, I mean, that's just insane. Thomas Massey the other day said he had a he had a piece. He was out there talking about how $1 trillion deficits, as you mentioned, is going to be the norm. He goes, but according to some of the estimates, you could see several years with $2 trillion deficits based on that. I mean, we can't continue. I mean, they just the gravy train has got to stop at one point. And and the two trillion. I mean, I, I've I've been in as you put it. I've been in the weeds on these numbers, and the two trillion isn't all that far fetched. 
all you need to do to get to $2 trillion is continue the current tax cuts. Now, remember, the individual tax cuts are largely set to expire in 2026. The corporate tax cuts are, are, are permanent. They were made permanent. But the individual tax cuts expire in 2026. Um, and all you need to do to get to $2 trillion is continue – is vote to continue those tax cuts, not let them expire in 2026, but continue and continue the type of spending that Congress passed earlier this year uh, in the in the budget uh, the budget reconciliation reconciliation act. So those two things, just those two things, get you to two trillion dollar annual deficits. I I mean the debt we're piling on. Future generations at the federal level, we'll, we'll get to the state level in a moment, but the debt we're piling on to future generations at the federal level is staggering. The, the, the legacy we're giving our kids um, as, a, as we get into the millennial generation of the, of the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, the debt we're piling on these kids is just staggering. And, what they're, and the lifestyle uh, that they're going to have is not going to be anywhere near the lifestyle we've given ourselves by borrowing, essentially borrowing all this money from the future uh, in the form of increased spending and, and, and tax cuts um, and running Social Security down, the other things we're doing. Uh, uh, the lifestyle we've given ourselves is not going to be is not going to be anywhere near what what these what our kids uh, are going to be able to enjoy. I had a post the other day that it, it, it was it was in response to some analysis that was getting us toward this two trillion in, in debt and the 30 trillion uh, or the two trillion in annual deficits and the 30 trillion in debt, and 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 it essentially said, look, you know, we call the World War II generation the greatest generation. They fought a war, they saved the world, they saved democracy, saved the world from tyranny, uh, and f- fought a two-front war successfully, and then they paid for it. You know, when when you get into the huge national debt, we piled up huge national debt during World War II. But when you look at the 1950s and the 1960s, they they essentially paid it down. They they got responsible, fiscally responsible, and paid off that debt. This generation, we're fighting some wars, yes, but not on the not on the level of World War II. Uh, This generation is just piling up uh, debt on top of debt uh, uh, as we as we you know try to make our lives. Uh, better try to enjoy things uh, more, more spending, uh, more borrowing, um, and we're and we're passing on all that. We're not paying it down. We're passing it on to the next generation, and I think this generation is in danger of being called the most selfish generation compared to the greatest generation from World War II. Right. This generation is on the verge of being called the most selfish. So um, it it is it is not. Uh, a good situation uh, that we're putting ourselves into. And I think it's a fair question in the Don Young race uh, to, to question, you know, as we're on the as we're on the cusp of the 2020s, as we're on the cusp of trillion dollar debts, potentially two trillion dollar debts with just a couple of things uh, 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 going wrong uh, in, in resulting in that increased uh, annual deficit. I think it's a fair question in the Don Young race. Don, are you are, are you putting us on the right track? Are you looking out? For the next generation, are you looking out for seniors? I mean, if we if we drain the Social uh, Security trust fund, if we drain the Medicare trust fund, we're talking about some huge cuts that are going to occur in those benefits. That, according to a recent Wall Street Art Journal article, a, a huge number of seniors are depending upon. Right. So, are you, Don Young, doing the right things to put us on track to be able to have our fiscal house? Uh, uh, not in perfect order, but in in better order uh, in the 2020s. And the answer is to this point, he's not. Right. He's not. He's put us on track to put us into that difficult situation. Well, and this is the question about – go ahead. No, I just think it's a fair question in this in this election cycle. Well, and I I would agree with that. And I think this is the the, the real this is the real dichotomy here. We can either control this is like, you know, you're driving a car and you can you've got a choice. You could either control the crash or the car's going to you know, you could either have a controlled crash or the car's just going to crash arbitrarily. I think that's what we're looking at right now. Congress has the opportunity now to throw the brakes on. They have the opportunity now to slow down. I don't know if they could stop what is coming. 
uh, just because of their recklessness and their spending over not just Congress but the last 30 years. Uh, but they could at least try. Instead, it's like they're blithely just proceeding ahead, pouring. You know, it's like the bridge is out and they're in the train car and they just keep shoveling coal into the into the locomotive like it's all going to be fine on the end. You're not going to make the jump. There's not enough track. I mean, when it does hit, you can either slow it down or you can make it seriously ugly. And they just don't see – there just does not seem to be the political will to stop this, this train. Yeah, I, I – that's a great analogy, Michael. And and to sort of put it in concrete terms, we we've got. It, and let's use Social Security as an example because that's a that's one that resonates with this generation. Um, we've got a situation where the the baby boom uh, 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 demographic, the baby boom generation, has moved through, you know, being born, working, and now moving into retirement. And we've got a, we've got some years left before the baby boom generation goes fully into retirement. Huge demographic bubble that's worked its way through uh, through time. Social Security depends primarily on payroll taxes, right? And payroll taxes are assessed on payrolls. the The time the the the, the time to deal with the Social Security issue, and part of it's going to have to be through increasing payroll taxes. We've just underpaid what we've promised uh, this this generation when they get into retirement. Part of the solution to this is increase payroll taxes. Well, if you don't increase payroll taxes now, but you still have at least a part of the baby boom generation working through, uh, through the, the work cycle, uh, if you wait a few years until they're all retired, you've got a much lower population, a much lower working population that you're now trying to load those increased costs on. So you're, so you're, the, the amount of increase you have to load on the next generations uh, on in, in terms of payroll taxes or income taxes, if you're going to start drawing from the general fund, the amount of dollars you have to load on the next generation per worker is just huge. So – if you start now, if you start now to, to address this problem, yes, it's going to be uh, it's going to be burdensome. We're going to have to increase payroll taxes uh, uh, to some degree to, to help deal with this situation. But it's a heck of a lot better to start now while you still got at least a portion of the baby boom generation in the working population paying payroll taxes than if you wait until they move through entirely. They're all in retirement. And you're loading the burden on a much smaller working population to to, to deal with uh, to deal with the, the the burden you've got. Yeah, no, absolutely. Brad Keithley's our guest. We're talking about oil, gas, politics, and more national politics now, and the uh, national deficit. I mean, I just think if we don't get a handle on this, it's you know, it's it's it will won't end pretty. Let's just put it that way. Um, let's uh, let's move on to your third and final point, and that of course is the fact that in spite of the fact that there's a potential lawsuit or a lawsuit now going forward on HB 331, uh, the governor has decided, nope, we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to stick it. We're going to we're going to stick our pen to it and make it happen anyway. That's got some ramifications. It does. So HB 331 is a, is something we've talked about a lot uh, on the program over the past uh, legislative cycle. It is the bill uh, that authorizes borrowing up to a trillion dollars. Uh, of oh, excuse me, up to a billion dollars. I got to switch back from federal <laughs> issues now back to state issues. Up to a billion dollars um, of on st- of state debt uh, to pay off oil companies early, certain oil companies early, uh, uh, faster than what the statute contemplates. We're going to borrow up to a billion dollars to do that, but shifts the costs uh, largely to the to the 2020s. It, it sort of kicks the can down the road, says this generation doesn't need to, to worry about it. Uh, those costs are going to be now shifted to the 2020s. Um, that bill, for all the reasons we've discussed through through this past legislative session, uh, I think is the wrong way to go. We're just increase the, increasing the burden uh, on those who come in the 2020s. We're draining our savings currently. We're not leaving them any savings. We're increasing their costs by kicking the can down the road, kicking these costs down the road, forcing the next generation to deal with them in a time when the fiscal issues, frankly, are going to be even more difficult uh, for Alaskans uh, than they are now. We're just adding to their burden down the road. That bill passed the legislature, notwithstanding uh, the concerns we and others raised. That bill passed the legislature. Uh, But it's not dead yet. I mean, yes, the governor signed it. 
but there's a lawsuit uh, that's been filed out there uh, that the that is an unconstitutional bill. Um, it seems fairly clear from the Constitution that there's a that there's a very clear issue about that, um, and um, and so the 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 that issue is not dead yet. It may be reversed in the Supreme Court, even if it's not. The litigation is going to take a while to resolve itself, and I think it's still going to be alive when the next legislature, the next governor is elected, and the next legislature convenes. And I think reversing that decision, repealing HB 331, going back to the payment schedule that we had before is, is a legitimate proposal and something that the next uh, legislature should consider. This generation ought to pay its own bills. We ought not – if we're going to be draining the reserves in this generation, as we have been, we've drained something like 14 to $15 billion out of our reserves in the last six, five years or so. If this generation is going to drain the reserves, it, it by gosh, ought to pay its bills. And kicking those bills, draining the reserves and kicking those bills, uh, those, uh, the spending responsibility to the 2020s, I think is just a very bad thing to do. So I think three, because of the lawsuit – um, uh, that I think is well-founded. I think 331 stays alive uh, as an issue through this election cycle. It's certainly something that I'm going to be talking about uh, in various races, something that, that I'm going to be talking about on this program and, and elsewhere, um, and something that I'm going to urge uh, the next legislature, the candidates to take a position on uh, in this race, uh, in, in this cycle, and for uh, people to be elected that will repeal it. Uh, in the next legislature. I, um, you know, I, I, I'm not even sure what happens now. I mean, the governor has, has signed this bill, even though it's in legal limbo. Are they going to attempt to, are they going to attempt to put these out for bond right now while it's in limbo? Or, I mean, what, what, what do you think happens? What do you think happens in that scenario? I mean, because if they do that and they put the bonds out and they start paying people, even though it's in legal limbo, I mean, do they go back and say, "Nope, I'm sorry, we need that money back"? I mean, I, I just, I, I don't even know how that works. The governor said the governor was asked that question after he signed 331 uh, up in Fairbanks, and the governor said that he doesn't think the bonds will go out um, uh, uh, until the uh, until the litigation is resolved. This litigation is fairly clear. I mean, um, people are going to try to confuse it, but this litigation is fairly clear. Article nine. Section 8 of the Constitution says this, no state debt shall be contracted unless authorized by law for capital improvements or unless authorized by law for housing loans for veterans and ratified by a majority of the qualified voters of the state who vote on the question. So cutting to the chase, Article 9, Section 8 says, no state debt shall be contracted unless ratified by a majority of of the qualified voters of the state who vote on the question. It doesn't say some state's debt shall not be contracted. It says <laughs> no state debt shall be contracted. And and everybody who's associated with 331 admits it's debt. So that's what the Constitution says. They admit that, that what they're issuing is, is debt. They try to say it's not really debt within the meaning of debt, the term debt in the Constitution. But I don't see any asterisks. On the on the on the in the Constitution that says debt doesn't really mean debt uh, in some instances. So I think I think this is a fairly clear, fairly straightforward constitutional question. As I said, the administration will try to confuse it, but I think it's a fairly straightforward question. In that situation, even if the administration tried to go out with bonds, uh, I don't think you would find anybody. In, I don't think you would find the financial markets willing to buy the bonds. Uh, with uh, with this question out there, because what would happen is sort of like the LIO, sort of like the Anchorage LIO, right? Uh, the state signed a lease, um, and uh, and and the owners of the building, the guys who redid the building, thought they had a lease, thought they had a had a payment schedule. The state was committed to, um, and then you know the courts questioned questioned the lease, the courts questioned the state's obligation to make the payments, and all of a sudden the state stopped pay making the payments. So I don't think you're going to find bondholders or, or bond buyers you know, rushing to buy these bonds right. with the legal, legal status of the, of the statute in question. Uh, and I think the governor was recognizing reality when he answered the question after the Fairbanks signing by saying, no, these bonds won't go out. So it's going to remain a live issue uh, to me. 
uh, and to others uh, through the through the election cycle. You have to wonder why these you know why these elector why these uh, uh, representatives rather why these uh, elected officials decided to move forward with this when that was obviously a, a key component to this whole deal uh, as to whether or not a key question of legality on this uh, to begin with. Although I'm not convinced that these guys got all the information that they were supposed to. Um, quite honestly, uh, or if they were fed even selective information uh, to make these decisions. That was kind of my impression after talking with Tammy Wilson about this, is that I don't know as they were getting all the facts. And again, that's part of the problem with being stuck down there in Juneau. You don't have access to everybody's opinion, I think. Well, I, and, that's, and that's fair, and I, and I think that's true. Uh, you and I talked about the facts. I'm, I'm sure. sorry that yeah. that if legislators feel feel they feel they didn't get exposed to them, but um, but it's it's. I mean, th- th- this issue of constitutionality came up during the debate. Um, the uh, the legis- legislative council uh, opined that he thought it was that this bill uh, was subject to serious constitutional question. That for me would have been a red flag. The administration, the attorney general, came out. Uns- not surprisingly, given the fact that they were backing the bill, right? Uh, the administration came out and said, "Oh no, no, no! Don't no worry constitutional about constitutional question. We'll be fine on that. <laughs> Don't worry about it." Yeah. So, but but <clears throat> the suit's been filed. The constitutional provision is what it is. No state debt shall be contracted unless ratified by a majority of the qualified voters, um, and and that's going to work its way through court. And it's not just going to be. I mean, like most major constitutional questions, it's not going to be resolved. Uh, by the when the superior court the 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 beginning court uh, renders an opinion it, its opinion you'll go to the supreme court and uh, and this is it i mean it's a it's a legitimate question of whether uh the state the state can find ways around the constitution that that'd be a that that's a big concern i mean we think we've got problems now <laughs> wait till they figure uh, out how yeah of, yeah, kicking the can down the road. If the Supreme Court says, "Oh yeah, don't don't worry about those words," uh, you can call something something. You can call a you know a cow a a rabbit, and if you call it a rabbit, it, it's no no longer a cow. The Supreme Court uh, uh, validates that. Then, gosh, you know we're we're off to even bigger problems. Right. So I think this is a I think this is a very serious issue. Brad Keithley writes on all of these issues. You can find him over at Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget on Facebook. I've got a link in the top of the description on the Facebook video there. You could just follow it on over. Uh, Brad is going to be giving us some deeper analysis on some of these candidate races, uh, and I'm going to be soliciting his opinion on some of the other various races down, again, getting down into the weeds. It's what we do with Brad. Uh, it's what uh, it's what he and I seem to be best at when we get together and discuss these issues. Uh, Brad, anything else you want to hit before we uh, let you out the door today? No, Michael, I think I've played in the dirt, uh, as you put it at the beginning of the program, uh, <laughs> uh, long enough on this. But, but I do think, I, you know, to sort of go back up to the higher level, to get back up to the higher level, there are issues. This isn't just – these legislative races are not just about – who you like best or who's been there the longest or, or who's done, who's done what there are some defining issues in this race. How does your candidate feel about the PFD? Does your candidate, will your candidate support uh, appropriating the full PFD when, when that issue comes up? Will your candidate question HB 331 and kicking the can down the road with all these costs uh, when, when that issue uh, comes back up, there are issues that differentiate candidates. And you might have a candidate who's been there for a long period of time uh, that, that you, you've become comfortable with and like, but if they're on the wrong side of these issues, uh, it's much better to, to go with a, a younger new candidate uh, uh, who's, who's right on the issue. So that's something, that's something that we'll, we'll, be t- we'll be talking about through this entire election sec- cycle. Issues matter. The candidate personalities matter a little bit, but issues matter more. Uh, and, uh, and and identifying where these candidates are on the issues is going to be critical. Well, and that I guess that leads me to one, one last self-serving question then. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to the two interviews I've done in the last uh, few days here. One was with Mead Treadwell, the other was with Mike Dunleavy, and I hit on every one of those issues that you brought forward, plus some more, Charter of Changes and more. Uh, did you happen to get a chance to listen to both those interviews? I've listened to Meads. I haven't had a chance to listen to the one with with Dunley. Okay. And 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 and, and the answers that Meads had 
were sort of my problem generally with meat over the years. A lot of a lot of skating, a lot of a lot of equivocating. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a concern. I assume the conversation with Dunleavy was more definitive. Um, Absolutely. There are some issues yeah. I disagree with Mike on, but but on fiscal issues, I, I, I I'm. I, I will guess that the answers were more definitive. Yeah, no, I mean, we, we talked about it, and it pretty much, as you said, I think Dunleavy checked all the boxes that you were just talking about and looking for, and uh, and Mead was very much, in my mind, more of business as usual or, or more of the same, as it were, when it's all said and done. Yep that that will be that will be a problem as we get into this campaign, and I'm sure we'll talk about that on an issues basis as we as we as we go through this. Absolutely, uh, Brad Keithley has been our guest uh, with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Again, find them on Facebook and more. Brad, thanks for coming out and being part of the program today. We appreciate you as always being part of the Michael Duke Show. Michael, thanks for having me, and I and I look forward to uh, d- digging in the dirt more in future episodes. <laughs> appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.